In this video, we are going to discuss chemical bonding. So chemical bonding is the way that atoms come together to form compounds and molecules. There are two types of chemical bonding. The first type is ionic bonding. Ionic bonds are when one element takes electrons from another so that you end up with a cation and an anion, and the bond is formed from the electrostatic attraction of the resultant ions. So if we were going to look at an ionic bond formed between lithium and fluorine, we would have our nucleus, if we're looking at our nucleus, lithium atom, and corresponding to the electrons in the first period or row uh, energy level of the periodic table or the first orbital or first energy level on the atom, there are two electrons. And in the second energy level, there is one electron. So lithium is atomic number three. So it has three protons and three electrons when it's neutral. So therefore, it's going to preferentially lose an electron to form a lithium plus one. But right now, what we're looking at is the neutral atom. So next, we would look at fluorine. And fluorine's going to have its nucleus. Fluorine has an atomic number of nine. And so in its first energy level, just like lithium, it's going to have two electrons. But in its second energy level, it's going to have seven electrons. And this would be the valence electrons that fluorine has. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And because it is one square away, if you look at your periodic table, fluorine is one square away from having a complete valence shell. Remember, a complete valence shell is eight valence electrons for everything except hydrogen and helium. Then what's going to happen is in order for lithium to form lithium plus one and fluorine to form fluorine negative one, what's gonna happen is one of these electrons from the lithium is going to go over to the fluorine. So that what we end up with is our lithium plus one ion and a fluorine with eight valence electrons instead of seven. Now this now has a positive charge, this lithium ion, and this fluoride anion now has a negative charge. And because positive and negative charges attract, we end up with the compound lithium fluoride, where the lithium and the fluorine are very, very close together. And what they actually form is a crystal lattice where you have a lithium ion and then a fluoride anion and then another lithium ion, and then another fluoride anion. And these will form layers. And on top of, so this would be a single layer of a lithium fluoride crystal. On top of this fluorine would be a lithium. On top of this lithium would be a fluorine. On top of this fluorine would be a lithium. And so essentially every positive charge is surrounded by six negative charges. And these constitute a crystal lattice. 
So this is basically what a lithium fluoride is. Lithium uh, ionic bonds tend to have uh, very high melting points compounds that have ionic bonds because there's this positive negative interaction and there's six essentially interactions between every positive is surrounded by six negatives and each negative is surrounded by six positives. So that's essentially how ionic bonds form and exist. Compounds with this type of, or ionic compounds with this type of negative, positive, negative, positive, um, repeating pattern, they have very high melting points because one is surrounded by the other, but they're very brittle because you can, if you misalign these, so you're going from a lithium on top of the fluorine and a fluorine, fluoride on top of the lithium, if you get one off so that there's a fluoride on top of a fluoride and a lithium on top of a lithium, then these compounds will, will be set up so that the ions actually repel each other on the different layers and they'll fracture very easily. So an example of a common ionic compound is table salt. Table salt is sodium chloride. And while it's fairly high melting, you can put your salt in your frying pan and it will look at the frying pan and not melt in any way, shape, or form, but it's very easy to crush. And so some of these bonds between these ions can be quite easily broken. Ionic bonding can occur not just between singly charged positive and negative ions, but it can occur between ions of different charges as well. For instance, should we have calcium? And if we look at calcium on the periodic table, it's in group two, so it has two valence electrons, and we will remove those two valence electrons when it forms ions. So that means it would form a plus two charge. And if we used, say, oxygen, which has six valence electrons, it's easiest for it to form an ion by stealing two electrons from something. So it will form a minus two charge. And these two compounds will come together to make the formula of calcium oxide. So here, any time that we're looking at a formula of an ionic compound, which will be recognizable because ionic compounds form between metals and nonmetals. So nonmetals are much greedier for electrons, and they tend to steal electrons from metals, which uh, make positive charges very easily. So any time that we see a compound where the first element is a metal, uh, that would be something on the left-hand side of the periodic table, then we would understand that that metal is going to form a charge based on its position of the periodic table. Now, we can form compounds with transition metals. I believe that that's probably beyond the scope of what you'll be asked on the nursing exam. So um, stick with the alkaline alkaline or alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals, which are group one and group two on the periodic table. Those are the ones that you'll most likely be asked about on the exam. And so in any ionic compound, you're going to look at the periodic table and in the periodic table review that we looked at, that we did earlier, we predicted what charges those metals were going to make. And if you're asked what the charge is in a compound, that's how you're going to determine what those charges are going to be. So next, we have covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are bonds formed when electrons are shared. And remember, this is my uh, little shorthand for electrons between atoms. In this case, we might have an oxygen atom, and we're going to pretend that this O is the nucleus of the oxygen atom, and it would have two electrons in its first energy level, 
And since oxygen has six valence electrons, it would have one, two, three, four, five, six electrons in its second energy level. And then we would add hydrogens, which each have one electron in the lowest energy level because hydrogen only has one electron total. And when these two or these three atoms actually get together to form a molecule, because molecule is the term we use for covalently bound compounds, we would see something where the oxygen actually shares electrons with the hydrogens. By sharing electrons, hydrogen manages to fill its outer energy level or outer shell of electrons because that will hold two. And if you look at where hydrogen is on the periodic table, there's only one square left in the row. So there's only one electron space that it can use to complete its valence shell. And if you look at oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons to begin with. It's two squares away from having the outer valence shell full or two electrons away from having its outer valence shell full. And this way, it gets its one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight valence electrons that it needs. So in a covalent compound, electrons are shared. In a ionic compound, uh, the electrons actually uh, are transferred between one element and the other element um, to form a compound and a complex structure where the ions are surrounding each other. Covalent bonds are the strongest of the chemical bonds um, because they this sharing of electrons in between the two atoms doesn't come apart terribly easily. Even when you heat water to very, very high temperatures, you still end up making steam, but steam is still H2O. And a type of crystal that's formed out of totally covalent bonds would be an example of a diamond. And as you know, diamonds are exceedingly difficult to break. They are very, very strong. They're known as one of the strongest types of crystals that are out there. And that is because all of the crystal structure in a diamond is formed from carbon-carbon covalent bonds. And this is what makes that structure so incredibly strong and resilient that it survives at extremely high temperatures, uh, is very difficult to break. Uh, you have to put it under enormous stress to get the crystal to fracture. So if you're looking to rate the types of bonds that occur on by stability, then covalent bonds are in general much stronger than ionic bonds. Also, they are the bonds which most biomolecules such as proteins, DNA, carbohydrates, uh, most of those structures are made up of covalent bonds. And then there are some ionic components that in solution will happily dissociate. And that allows for things like the DNA molecules, the ionic bond type components are what enables DNA to unzipper. It's what denatures proteins. Those are the types of bonds that are broken when proteins denature, um, not the covalent bonds that are there. So here are the review questions at the end of this video. Pause your video, look at them, complete them on your own, and I will return in 10 seconds to discuss the answers to the questions. So if we look to answer question number one, what is the charge of the oxygen atom in the compound MgO? And we look to find magnesium on our periodic table. We'll notice that magnesium 
has only two, elect two valence electrons. So it's going to form a plus two charge because it's going to lose these two valence electrons. And it's going to lose them to the oxygen, which is here on the periodic table. And it's two electrons away from having a full valence shell. So it's going to steal two electrons from magnesium, forming a minus two charge. And the plus two magnesium minus two oxygen are going to get together and form magnesium oxide. So the answer to the question, what is the charge on the oxygen atom in the compound MgO, is that it's going to be a negative two charge. If we look at the second question, what is the strongest type of chemical bond? The strongest type of chemical bond that we've discussed here is a covalent bond. The sharing type of bond is the strongest type of chemical bonding discussed here.